59. It was uh, masks and kids outside. Go ahead and start that now. All right, welcome guys. We're just gonna wait a moment here. I think our attendees are popping in on Zoom. It's been a while. I was I was saying uh, to, to Christy that it's been a while that we have been uh, working in this way. Uh, I got used to these casual conversations about art via Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, and we've been back in person, uh, which has been delightful, but uh, I'm really looking forward to today. I, th I think this format really works. Uh, it, it so fun. today's it event, um, today's event is in connection with our exhibition, uh, Kindred, Traditional Arts of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. So um, I'm not sure how many of you in attendance today have had a chance to see that show. This exhibition has been on display in Crooked Tree Art Center Petoskey's galleries, uh, our Gilbert and Bonfield galleries. Uh, the show will run through Thanksgiving. So the last day is November 27th. So if you haven't had a chance to join us, um, I hope that you will have a chance to visit our campus and take a look at the show. So during the run of the show, every Thursday at 10, we have been providing an educational program um, in connection with our um, exhibition. And this week's guest, is Marsha McDowell. Marsha has actually been kind enough to join us for a previous virtual coffee at 10 where we had a conversation about traditional art. Um, I'm gonna take a moment here to introduce our guest and then we will open it up to a conversation. So those of you joining us on Zoom and Facebook, please feel free to feed any comments or questions into the comment section or the Q&A. Uh, Christy and I will monitor that and feed your questions and comments into the conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started, okay? Uh, so our guest, again, is Marsha McDowell, who is a curator with the uh, MSU Museum, and her projects have taken her all around the world, and um, we're really delighted to invite her as our guest today because she has been involved with, the, with our show here in Petoskey. Uh, Kindred features work from a number of private collections and a few public collections, in including the works at MSU. And so that's what we're gonna talk a little bit more about is, is the Anishinaabe works at MSU. Um, but Marsha received her BFA, MFA, and PhD from Michigan State University. She's been employed as a curator there since 1977, but we were just talking and really she started her work with the museum earlier than that. So we're going to go ahead and say 1975. So she's been working in this area for quite some time. Um, she is also a leader in folk arts and traditional arts uh, in, in a broader sense. And um, we're really excited to see what she has to share with us today. Um, before we get into the meat of our conversation, I did want to introduce uh, and give Marsha a moment to tell us about a project that just opened yesterday. And that is an exhibition I believe it's called Dear Mr. Mandela, Dear Mrs. Parks, uh, that opened um, in Africa, right? Marsha, so I, um, let's go ahead and do a virtual welcome to Marsha, and I'm going to turn the stage over. Marsha, why don't you tell us about that project to get us okay. started? Okay. Um, actually, I would, if you'll allow me to, I would like to start out with a land acknowledgement statement, because I'm sitting right here at Michigan State University on land um, that is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. And the university relied, resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. Now, I'll switch continents. Um, so, uh, Yesterday, um, there was a virtual and an in-person opening of an exhibition that I've been working on for a number of years, actually. Um, in two, 2008, uh, an exhibit was done, co-curated by myself, my husband, Dr. C. Kurt Dewhurst, also a curator at Michigan State University. And a group of people, curators, educators at the Nelson Mandela Museum in South Africa. The exhibit was called Dear, Mrs. Dear Mr. Mandela, Dear Mrs. Parks, Children's Letters, Global Lessons. And it was built upon uh, some collections of letters written to those two international icons of human rights, 
um, who were almost contemporary. And they, they actually did meet each other uh, for the first time in Detroit, Michigan. Um, they, they, the, the letters were just filled with uh, elements that paid tribute to some of the deep values that they, those two individuals shared. So we built this exhibition in 2008. It opened on Mr. Mandela's 90th birthday in Umtata, South Africa at the Nelson Mandela Museum. And he actually came, which was really exciting. And his wife, Gracha Michelle. Um, it, that exhibit's been touring all over South Africa for all these years, and it got shop worn. So the US Embassy stepped in last year to provide funds to redo the exhibition and create for now, a, a digital version and curriculum materials. So yesterday was the official launch of the physical um, exhibition. And um, yeah, it, it, technology, uh, the Zoom, the opening was you know, uh, accessible to people off of my computer to audiences and through two Facebook pages and YouTube. and. Uh, it, it was over two hours, and there's six hours time difference, but uh, we did a lot of pre-recorded pieces and showcased youth in, in the U.S. Uh, performing poetry, dance, and then likewise on the South African side. It was really fun. That's so exciting is what I said as I had to scroll all the way over to find my mic. How did, um, so how did the letter, how, what, what is the update? What, what happened with the new vision and an update to the exhibition this time around? Well, definitely, um, you know, we, there were some important facts like since then, um, Mr. Mandela has passed away. So we had to uh, update some dates, but we also wanted to infuse it with um, contemporary issues. So we, inserted uh, text that was um, uh, referencing Black Lives Matter and images also of that. We uh, created one new panel that dealt with what is Jim Crow and what is um, apartheid. And it was a binational team. It, the team expanded, so it now included representatives of the Rose and Raymond Parks Institute in Detroit. Uh, educators from the Robin Island Museum and educators from the uh, Stellenbosch University Museum in South Africa. So yeah, and we had members of the family involved in writing text and developing the exhibition ideas too. Just, it was really a wonderful collaboration. And I think that, that, that actually will speak to how I work as a curator and how some of the collections, which you're getting a peek of behind my shoulder, um, were, were formed here at Michigan State University Museum. That's terrific. That's exactly what I was going to pick up on to transition to our project today is how collaborative your work is. I mean, I think um, when we're dealing with exhibitions and um, presentation uh, of creative work, it, it is often collaborative, maybe more than we even realize, but your work specifically uh, centers on that and is made possible because of that. And, and, and I'm really taken with how you, you know, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but how I can see you using your platform to, to give space and voice to others, right? So you wanna talk about that for a moment as we segue into the work behind you? Well, I can say that um, in addition to being a curator, I have headed since the late 70s, the Michigan Traditional Arts Program, which is a statewide service organization, um, research on service to traditional artists. So, um, you know, the, the phrase community engaged, it, it's community engagement on all of those projects. And that falls in line with the university's mission. We often work with 4-H, for instance, around the state um, that some of my most earliest work here at Michigan State was in conjunction with 4-H uh, leaders, 4-H uh, youth and um, the extension network. So um, yeah, collaboration and also thinking of trying to work together to solve problems and issues. 
Great. Well, you uh, lent some very uh, amazing and significant pieces, you know, um, for the show that we have here in Petoskey. Well, I was about to single things out, but that feels a little bit unfair, but definitely um, uh, the some, some pieces by Renee Wasson Dillard, uh, the To Our Sisters box by Yvonne Walker Kishik. And certainly we can see that there were several more that would have been lovely to highlight in our space here, um, but, but it is a team effort. So can you tell us a moment, Marsha, about how MSU began collecting uh, Anishinaabe artwork um, and some of the native collections there at the museum? Yes, and, and by the way, I, I did last night email a lot of um, artists who we've worked with over the years. So I'm, I'm hoping that at some point in time, we can turn this into a discussion and get their input too, um, because I'd love to hear their perspectives. Now, in hindsight, you know, what has it meant to them as well to have worked on these projects and have their pieces in the collection here? So yes, yeah, so like we said, I think we can make that happen. That would be great. Yeah, so um, maybe this will all be preamble to this uh, discussion then. So in um, 1975, my husband, Kurt, and I got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to do a survey of, of folk arts in Michigan. And so using that extension network, as a basis, we began to um, visit as many historical museums and uh, the contacts, heritage sites in Michigan, met with traditional artists. And what, then we were realizing we need to, to almost next do an exhibition and a project on contemporary folk arts. So in that first swipe, it was mostly looking at historical materials so we could get ourselves grounded in what's unique about this region and what's its history. So many of the traditional arts are connected with land, with, with water, uh, with um, traditions of using the land. Um, so, uh, and we have so many industries also that have uh, been in Michigan and from lumbering to automotive to farming to farming. And I, you know, all of those had um, folk arts associated with this, especially also not the, the, well, starting with the indigenous peoples and then the waves of immigration. There were also new old established traditions and then new ones fused into this, this um, place we call Michigan. So, um, so yes, uh, some 1976, we did this historical exhibition uh, of folk art. It was shown at the Kresge Art Museum at Michigan State University. And then two years later we did, and here's, I'm gonna be showing some books because I, we've got, these efforts have been documented. Um, we did something called Rainbows in the Sky, um, uh, contemporary, traditions, uh, folk art traditions in Michigan. And um, the, here you can see uh, some baskets that were, those were, were made by um, uh, Edith Bondi. And I think also um, Little Elk um, Thomas. Uh, so, so that was our first foray into doing documentation on reservations and in individual homes and becoming aware of how much contemporary work there was at Michigan. And, and so it just made us want to know more. And yeah, I think that that's that one up. of the, um, that's one of the things that's been really interesting about the project here at Purdue. Uh, and I would love to have you pause for a second to talk about that. Um, about that notion of tradition. You know, when I'm bringing groups through the gallery, I'm pointing out that, you know, not too many of the pieces that we have on display are all that old. These are contemporary pieces and a lot of artists who are living and working today, um, but they're still traditional. I think a lot of times when we think of tradition, we think of, of old or old fashioned. Do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, um, actually I've got a couple of examples behind me. So let me go, go there, but um, here's just a, 
here's a page with an uh, image of Alice Bennett and her strawberry baskets up in, up in Mount Pleasant. So every time we did this, we were trying to collect the stories and also the images. So we made sure that these individuals' contributions were written into history. They're wherever we could, we didn't want to deal with just anonymous work. Um, let me get my white gloves on. Marsha, I know you can't speak to us because you're grabbing your gloves, um, but is that book still available? Can can our attendees find it? Maybe on, I think just on, you know, Amazon. His, yeah, it's out of print, long out of print. Um, this one was by Richard Keller and he's up uh, in your neck of the woods. And uh, this is a wonderful one that I think you know, he just, he colored all of these quills, but then made it in just this really, let's see, there, there, um, modern design. So I think that's just from behind me, that's one on the table that speaks to exactly that. Is this traditional? Well, yes, but it's also contemporary and it's also pushing the boundaries of art in this form. We have other examples. I, I just didn't pull those out of the cases. Yeah. One, one good example that we have um, that speaks to sort of the relationship of these artists to knowing their materials and knowing how to get the materials is a, a basket that was made by Kelly Church, a National Heritage Awardee, Kelly Church, a Michigan uh, a member of the one of our programs, the Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. And um, Kelly made this basket that looks very much like the strawberry basket be behind me, except it's out of mini blinds, plastic, white plastic mini blinds. And as she said about that basket, which we have on view in a little exhibition about Kelly right now at our museum, um, that exact you know, the mini blinds are a little bit bigger than uh, what she would use for a, a black ash splint, but at least it shows the form. And if there comes a time in Michigan when the black ash are no longer, and you have to wait until all of the seeds and the seed saving programs, you know, can germinate again and, and grow into trees again, at least there would be that form to show others that this is what we did. And also a reflection or, or a statement just about environmental protection, right? The idea of those, those vinyl mini blinds being the subject or the material that's available. We have a question in the chat that asks, um, do these artists that you're working with typically sign their work? No, not always, but um, some do. Um, Yvonne walker Kisha, she usually does. Sometimes she'll just put falling leaves on the bottom of her basket. Um, yeah, that's why when we, when we collect the baskets, why we want to have that documentation also so that we make sure that it, it, that, that the information about that basket becomes known. We were gifted a, an amazing uh, collection of over a hundred quill work baskets about four or five years ago. And, um, there are a lot of those that are not not signed but you know somebody very knowledgeable like uh, judy piranofsky who worked with us who is a quill worker herself she helped catalog that collection she can she can start identifying those and we we brought uh, elizabeth kimmel on in and she could just go like oh well that's so and so or that's so and so and because they know that those designs are I wouldn't say own, but are indicative of that family's tradition of, of design. In fact, here behind me, it's one that actually was um, there, made by Donald Naganash. He was really known for that pattern. It's a nice example. And 
This one is not signed, but it's by Bernard Parkey. And, and he was part of one of our projects. He was part of, the, I think, the little Traverse Bay Band uh, uh, art project uh, that, again, well, I should back up a little bit. So, so we did those first two exhibits, and then we started focusing on different regions of Michigan, different genres of art, and um, trying to dig deeper in. And most of those projects were collaborative. Some of them, we initiated the collaboration. Some of them, the collaborative um, partners came to us and said, could we work with them? Here's an example. We did uh, this uh, book, uh, Yawiyang, translating to who we are with the uh, Zibawin Cultural Center at um, Mount Pleasant, Saginaw Chippewas. And we, we documented, we worked with them to document art of that tribe. And yeah, so, and some of them are basket makers, but they all had to be tribal members. And I think that is what gave Frank Gatawagisha, who I invited to attend this morning, but he emailed me this morning and said, he would have been here, but he's in Glasgow at the, the um, climate summit. He said, somebody has the excuses, I tell you. Um, Anyway, I think he got the idea after seeing that book that he wanted to have one done of members of the little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa. And so this one became a true collaboration. Um, not that the Zippo Wing wasn't, but uh, in this case, what we did is we had a grad student who was working for Michigan State, graduate student at Michigan State, Kathy Vandekar, who is Odawa. And so she and Robert, Robert Chaganabi and um, Minnie Wambanimki, who's from Grand Traverse, uh, we, we all talked through what we wanted to achieve in terms of just a survey of traditional artists in Little Traverse Bay Band um, or in that region. And then once we all decided we were sort of in agreement of the scope. Then um, Robert and Catherine, they just went off and they were the ones who chose who to be interviewed, who to be documented, whose stories were gonna to be told. And it was, it was a great documentation project. But then uh, we had one of our final meetings and it was Frank who says, well, now we have to make this an exhibit. And, and so, so we made and we put together, we got some more funding from another source because all of these are take grants to, to underwrite. We got funding from, a, um, I think it was from Michigan Council for the Arts. And we put together an exhibition that was at the, uh, shown only in one place, which was the Andrew Blackburn Museum. But as we prepared for the exhibition, we also decided, well, let's create a collection. And so we acquired one piece from each artist and that piece was chosen by the artist. Um, the, the artists were chosen by Robert and Catherine. So in a sense, um, we had several selection processes going on, but um, ultimately we've got this lovely collection here at Michigan State, some of which we put on loan for your exhibition and we've got documentation, which we've turned over a copy of all that documentation to Little Traverse Bay Band uh, of Odawa. And um, yeah, so we've got this great little teaching collection now. And it does show a lot of people and um, whose stories maybe wouldn't have gotten out there otherwise. Uh, Marsha, I just want to come in. I, th I think that's really inspirational, thinking about how uh, the community can drive that process and, and do that sort of peer review in a sense, right? Um, that's really interesting to consider. Yeah, and here's another another project that we did with Nokmas. 
the uh, Sisters of the Great Lakes Art of American Indian Women. And again, this came out of the fact that Nokemis, with support from the Kellogg Foundation, was hosting three weekends of uh, professional development workshops for uh, artists, women artists in the Great Lakes region. Um, and some of them were, you know, Yvonne Walker Keisha uh, uh, is, uh, yeah, well, we had a number of, of, of artists from Michigan who were in here. They were all chosen by Kyle Crampton, herself an artist. Kyle is a Saginaw chip. And at the end of their three weekends, and I, I, I participated in one of their, their weekends as a presenter on writing grants. Um, all of the women have pretty much bonded together <laughs> and sharing the common denominator of artists who were passionate about their work. And so um, the facilitator, uh, Val Johnson, of this program and uh, Jan Wood, um, they said, we'd like to do an exhibition. And Nokomis is a learning center. It's not a collecting center. So they, and they couldn't accept a grant to do an exhibition there and, or to develop a collection. So they turned to me and said, would we collaborate? Um, they would raise money through a Kellogg grant to purchase one item from each of the artists. And then those pieces would all reside, live together in one of these cases. And it's the Nokomis uh, Sisters of the Great Lakes uh, case is a sign on the cabinet. And so again, um, the original roster of artists was selected by Kyle mostly. And I think Val Johnson had a little bit to do with that, but then the actual selection of the object from the artist was done by, again, by the artist. And so it was Yvonne Walker Kieschick's choice to make that sister's box um, that's in your exhibit right now was done as part of that Sisters of the Great Lakes project. And I'll show you one thing behind me. just want you to see this a little bit closer. This is the Shirley Browker piece. And she was also involved. Thank you. This is one that I was so excited when I looked at little digital images of, but could not accommodate for our show. Yeah. Tell us about this piece. Well, it, this is, you know, very indicative of her style. I'm gonna set it down again because it's heavy. Yeah, so she, she um, she does these uh, ceramic pieces, but with that cut out, like almost like filigree, and and she does, you know, she's just so talented, and she's got all these amazing designs. I saw one recently that she did, which is on missing women. Um, so, you know, there's a political statement and a, you know, a, a statement about lived experience um, in that piece. I would love to get a piece of those, that, <laughs> one of those in our collection. Um, yeah, so Shirley Browker, a uh, talented, talented individual. And you guys should do a show of her work someday. <laughs> um, I did want to also note that when I first started working here, our collection of baskets, well, of, of indigenous materials, is, was predominantly historical. And we had um, our baskets, we have a great basket collection uh, donated to us by Ari Olds, who had procured this collection, Ari Olds of Oldsmobile, um, who lived in Lansing. And he bought the collection of a man named Frank Covert or who's actually, we're understanding that it was Covert's wife of whom we know almost nothing. Covert was an Indian agent 
and he amassed a collection of historical baskets. So that collection is mostly representing the turn of the 1800s to the 1900s. And so when we were starting to do that work in 1975, we were on the cusp of looking at what was happening 100 years later. And so we do have another number on some of those, those uh, baskets are in the seminal book, uh, American Indian Basket by Otis um, Mason. Not any Anishinaabek pieces in here, but some of the samples that are in our collections. Now, just show you what's exciting here. Paul Lynn Swanson, our cultural collections manager, worked with me yesterday to pull out some samples of, of things, and um, we found this here. And this will give you a good example of how we care for items too. It's um, on this, it's on a little um, pad on top of this acid-free material and little muslin ties. And it's stuffed inside with acid-free tissue. So uh, yeah, it's just a lovely box. This is from that original Olds collection, covert collection. Marcia, speaking about care, um, obviously as people travel through the galleries, we have folks who have quill boxes in their collections or interested in acquiring them. Can you talk a little bit about how we care for these natural materials um, to, to help preserve them? <laughs> Sorry, good question. <laughs> no, here, and I'll answer that right after I show you this, because this is from uh, the collection that was just gifted to us about um, four or five years ago, and, you know, it's essentially the same style, but done a hundred years later. So well, um, caring for collections is, you know, keep them out of light. Uh, here where I'm sitting, which is our storage facility for cultural materials at Michigan State University Museum, uh, it's temperature and humidity controlled. Uh, the cabinet that like I have open with, to demonstrate how we uh, store our textiles behind us. Um, like every one of those textiles is rolled on an acid-free tube, covered with a, a mylar, or a dye tech, dye, I'm sorry, yeah, dye tech, um, which is a breathable film. And then again, using little muslin ties. Let's see, I'll see you. I'll pull it up. You probably see this. And then they just nest in these pull out drawers and it makes it pretty accessible for research, but also it's protecting all of our textiles. This morning, Lynn and I did pull out one of those textiles, unwrapped it carefully, rolled it down on the table behind me, and I will, uh, I'm gonna lift my computer for a minute so you can see the, the Odawa quilt that is behind me. That's beautiful. And you have one on exhibit right now in your exhibition that was made at the same time as that one, probably in Peshawar Town, probably in the uh, basement of the church. Uh, we're still doing that one is similar to this one in terms of other research projects. Um, when we saw this, saw that one, and then Frank Adamish owns one uh, through his grandfather, Minnie Wabanimki's grandmother made one. It's owned within her family. I think we know of about seven of those quilts that are extant. So hopefully we'll uncover some more. And But Minnie Wabanimki and I are, are doing some additional research on that and trying to pull together the stories of those why those were made and when they were made and 
who made them. Um, oh, hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm just lo looking at the, the, the chat. The chat, yeah. Yes. Darn yeah, Lynn, Lynn helped you out there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, the, so the quilt project, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that and how that started? Yeah, so, so one of the collaborative projects that we've done over the years is to have a festival. Um, we work with communities, with groups of artists. Uh, we did that for 30 years. It, it, um, it stopped in in 2017, but the each year we'd have a festival at Michigan on the grounds of Michigan State University or in the city of East Lansing, and brought together up to 100 uh, traditional artists from Michigan of all kinds: um, traditional cooks, traditional occupational um, reps, um, and we tried always to have native people and so we had a lot of over the all those 30 years we had a lot of, of um, people who were talented at either quill work or basket or bead work and so one year we did a a program sub program many little sub programs in our festival on um uh, potawatomi ojibwa and odawa quilting and invited a number of quilt makers to come and a friend of ours from the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian said, oh, and he's Cherokee and, and uh, Comanche. And he said, I, both my great, my grandmother's quilt. He says, you guys should investigate that outside of Michigan. Well, lo and behold, um, we, Fred Nowixi, uh, who, has already walked on, but Fred um, at the National Museum of the American Indian uh, pushed us to, to work with them on a national exhibition of native quilts. So we went back to some of the quilt makers that we knew in Michigan and then went with a team of uh, Native American uh, documentation team uh, across the country visiting powwows and native museums and ended up doing an exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian on native quilting traditions. And of course, you know, we're biased. So we made sure we had a number of Great Lakes uh, native quilts in there. And so as part of that project, the university did give us funding to purchase a quilt from as many of the individuals that we visited as possible. Therefore, we were able to get a number of quilts from uh, Anishinaabek quilts into the collection. And we got some beautiful ones with, you know, thunderbirds on them and stars and turtles and yeah. So, so that's, that's the story of the quilts. That's great. Can you tell me about the the patterning on the quilt or talk about that for a minute? I know that um, oh, yeah, you know the, the florals in the corner and the star in yeah. the center. Can you talk about influences for that? Yeah, and and at that time, you know, I was just learning about um, uh, woodlands art, and we took it to our friend and colleague uh, Jim McClurkin, and he took one look at that. He says, "Oh yeah," he says, "That's from up here." Um, so, yeah, it's it. I mean the star quilt known by many different names um in native country it's usually called the evening star or the morning star in non-native company or country it's often called star bethlehem but um it's common it's a common pattern used by many quilters over many years but this quilt and the one behind me and the one hanging in your exhibition have these very distinct corner pieces and these triangular pieces, um, elements where it's an applique floral design that is really from the Woodlands area. Thanks. Yeah, so there's, you know, some of our other programs have really um, been connected to like the wearing my hat of the head of the Michigan Traditional Arts Program 
have been through um, Michigan Heritage Awards program uh, where we've recognized artists for their excellence and their dedication to their teaching and their community. And then also the Michigan Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program where we match up a traditional artist with an apprentice and they are given, master artists is given a small stipend to over a set of several months to have a one-on-one -on -one learning teaching experience. And so we have tried over the years to collect one item from the, if it's a material culture person, one item from the master and one item from the um, apprentice. And so that has helped our, our program, uh, uh, you know, directly support artists as well as create a collection here. And I'll show you a couple of things. This is a piece uh, by Frank at who I, he had at least one uh, apprenticeship uh, serving as the master, I think with Sandy Dyer. And then he was awarded a Michigan Heritage Award. Edith Bondi did this amazing porcupine uh, basket. Um, yeah, so she also is a recipient of a Heritage Award. Patricia, I'm sorry, I'm getting that ring light. Uh, Patricia Shackleton uh, is also been a, a master artist. This is uh, birch bark um, biting and cutting. This amazing basket here, I'm gonna pull it close. Again, so you can also see how we care for objects. This one was made by Jenny Brown, a young woman. Um, and this is a strawberry basket. And on the top, I don't know, you can see a tiny, tiny little strawberry. On the Michigan Traditional Arts Program YouTube channel, you can see an interview with her. She was a uh, 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 well, we wanted her to come and be involved in another program that we coordinated with with uh, curators at the Smithsonian. It was uh, called uh, uh, Carriers of Culture, uh, Native Basket Traditions, and we had over a hundred basket artists from across the country who came to Washington, D.C. and for a 10-day period demonstrated their work and also talked about, well, they told stories, told stories about how they gathered, how they prepared their materials, why they did things a certain way. And we were able to get some funds from the Kellogg Foundation to have uh, 20 youth also come as part of that program and also sit every day on the National Mall and talk about how they are learning of their, their process of learning. We wanted Jenny to come to that, but she was under age and we couldn't have her. So we, we sought her out afterwards um, to, to do an interview with her. And she's an incredibly talented young woman, as you can see. But this was the program. Uh, at the Smithsonian and that was because we had done the quilt exhibit, they said, well, why don't you, let's do another art form and switch from quilts to, to be work. Um, yeah, maybe we got about 15 minutes left. Um, is, could we open it up to uh, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of things that pop through the chat and we're gonna go ahead and let those in attendance know to please ask any other questions in the chat or use the Q&A if you prefer. And actually I see um, Wasan is here. Hi, Renee, oh. so glad that you're here. 
Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to text you a message to see if it's okay if we talk about something you've shared with me in the past. Um, but Anne is asking, can you explain how to care for those traditional art pieces and natural materials in the home? So obviously you have state of the art, wonderful facilities to care for these archived pieces, but for independent collectors in their homes, any tips or suggestions? Um, specifically, I, I know that others have been told this as well, that they should occasionally spray their black ash baskets with water. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little thoughts on that? You know what? If, was, if you can make Wasan live, she's she's got, you know. Well, Wasan, let us know if you're okay with that, because I can. I can just let you talk. <laughs> i put you on the spot. If you'd be willing. But, you know, I talk about <laughs> climate control, about lights trying to keep pests away. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Okay, Renee says, okay, so let me just bear with me as I figure out how to click the right buttons to make that happen. Okay, so you can now talk, Renee. There you go. <laughs> I'm just gonna Hi, Renee. get up because I see that the plug that I'm plugged into for my computer is, is not working. So I'm gonna put in a different plug. But okay, Renee, so the question. Go ahead and talk. Yeah. So the question was about moisture? Yeah, well, specifically, we've had people asking about like their quill boxes in their homes, but I think this is relevant to ash baskets and other natural fibers as well. How to care for them to keep them from warping or cracking. Right, okay, so with black ash splint baskets, it's true, they do need a drink once a year. I give them a drink um, if, if it's at least boiling in the house. I kind of consider I give them a drink this last week because I've been making corn. So, you know, we've been boiling a lot of corn. So anyway, that, that's one way to give them a drink. Another older tradition is, or a newer tradition is uh, kind of get all your baskets and put them out in the spring rain and give them a nice drink. Um, if they have a drink, they tend to last longer. If your baskets are on display in your in your house, it's good to turn them because the sunlight will change the patina. With black ash, they're gonna get darker every time they get wet. So if you wanna keep them white and pristine, then you have to do it the way MSU does it. But if you are just, uh, you, then just enjoy the patina as it turns a golden brown on the ash splints. They'll, uh, you can see Edith so Renee, how, how big of a drink is that? Like what what is it? What is considered a drink? So put it out in the spring rain. I can kind of imagine that if you're using boiling water, how long are you doing that for? And are you fully submerging or, or letting them in? No, I'm just boiling the water and letting the steam in the house mm -hmm. give it a drink. So you can do that in the in the shower too. I've been known to take them all in there and get the dust and stuff off. But you have to be careful with some of the dyes that they don't run. And so, you know, it might be a toothbrush type situation if you don't have them in a cabinet to kind of keep dust and stuff off them. But I use a real soft brush like what they use on your car and then uh, get them nice and wet and brush over them and then they'll be nice and fresh. I think water keeps them alive longer. Um, that's with ash splint. With um, with birch, birch has a resin in there and it's more about the heat and the cool. So the temperature is more important with birch bark than the water to keep it from warping and so on and so forth. I would never put my birch quill work in direct sunlight. So. Thanks so much. <laughs> yes, it does. If, if it's okay, I'm going to keep you in, in the spotlight. I think Marsha has something to share, but then I have one more question for you, Renee, if you're willing. Sure. Well, you know, I, I've just got, uh, I'll just quick, I don't know if Badabin Web Kamiga is on, but I, I pulled out, there's like a little pair of dance regalia cuffs and these sweet little um sequined uh moccasins that she made it's all part of a complete uh set of regalia and that was part of another collaboration with the nokomis learning center on um dance regalia and 
Mini Wabanimki um, took photographs at a number of powwows, including up in your area. And then we had an artist who got glossary and to help people understand all of the parts of, of different dance outfits. So that's just a shout out to Adaban. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. So my question, it really is to both of you, but it is kind of directed to you, Renee, now that we've got you in the hot seat. Um, and for those of you new in attendance today, if you didn't catch Wasan, uh, and her, her presentation with us, the recording is available online and she has a number of pieces in our show in Petoskey now and, and certainly something you should not miss. Um, but was on what I wanted to ask you was in one of our conversations, you were talking about your own research, you know, in addition to your creative work, just the, the research that you're doing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna botch this a little bit, but you were talking about how you were searching certain weaving and it almost became a calling card or a signature. And so as we were talking earlier in today about how you recognize somebody's work without a signature or that certain processes or patterns are passed down through, uh, through um, kind of traditions, I guess I'm really curious how that relates to your research, Renee. Can you tell us a little bit about that? On the edges of bulrush weaving, there's salvage that's woven in there. And those edges carry different numbers and different patterns according to who had made them. And most likely, according to my understanding of mother-daughter relationship, it's kind of her dowry to carry those patterns on. So one mat pattern may change over time, but the salvage edge is always gonna be the same because how it's put together and how it's ended. And so kind of accidentally, I figured out that in one area in Minnesota, it was all done this way. And one area in Iowa, it was done this way. And I'm well in the process of finding out our pattern right here, because the pattern that I'm using now in my current bulrush weaving is Kickapoo. And um, because that's what my mother and Audrey Atkinson both learned from a woman uh, named Wapahopakwa. And uh, she brought that back to me, and that's what I'm doing here, so. Thank you. I think that's so fascinating and, and just a beautiful physical manifestation uh, of, of how we, we move ideas. Um, you know, we as have people. a great collection of Wasan's bags here at Michigan State. Again, some of them on loan to you guys. Yes, we're very lucky. Okay, so um, I want to address a couple things that have popped up in the chat and then see if there's any last comments that anybody would like to make. Um, so still more concerns about caring for their items, which is great, you guys keep buying native works and, and caring for them in your collection and then you know where to give them when you no longer want to care for them, right? Um, so um, one question is, should you use distilled water and a spray bottle to care to add moisture? Wouldn't say you Anybody? have to go all that far. Okay, okay. So you don't have to go all that far. And then, oh, a spray hi, bottle um, would, might be a good idea. Okay, okay. Spray bottle might be a good idea. And then we, Ani, we have Yvonne's daughter, Kimberly Keisha yeah. here. Hi. Hey, um, here's this. Is that hers? No, this is her mother's. Um, all her right. Mother. Yeah. And Kim, I don't think we have one of yours yet yet. And Kim, I haven't seen yours yet, so I, I would like to do that also. Um, but she's letting us know that don't leave your quill box out in the sunlight. Quills will fade uh, like our hair when the sun is bleached. And she recommends keeping them on acid-free paper in cases to, to keep the dust and microbes off. So thank you, Kimberly. I just All wanted right. to uh, a couple more. Well, uh, yeah, great. Rita Corbier that she was in uh, some of the early research in the 19, and she came to um, the Smithsonian with us uh, on one of the festivals, but I love it. She's from Manitoulin Island and she made the porcupine quills stick right up like porcupines. 
This is from that collection too that we recently got. Daphne is the name on here. And this is from that early project with Lorraine or with um, LTBB. This is Lorraine Shenanaquits. So this is an interesting thing is, um, now, this is where um, you can trick people, I guess, because does this look like a Native American art piece? Well, it is. It, and it was uh, done by John, let's see, let me get his last name. It was part of the LTB project, and it's hard to shift this paper with white gloves. Um, yeah, it's Kiwagashkum, uh, John. So he, that this is the item that he chose to make for the LTBB uh, traditional arts project. So we like to break stereotypes too of what people perceive of as native art. That's a good example. Um, we've got documentation, for instance, of uh, quilts that Mrs. Parks made. And for all of the um, information that's out there about African-American quilts have to look a certain way, looking at this quilt, you would never know it was Mrs. Parks. It's just meticulously done it's a very traditional pattern and so you know all those words that are used to describe african-american quilt styles aesthetic don't apply to her quilt nonetheless she's an african-american um to to close this out if there are any final questions please feed those into the chat uh, marcia i guess i'd like to ask um where is msu with this collection now are you actively adding and growing in specific areas or what's the um, plan good question uh, at the moment we've uh had an administrative transition in time of covid of course we were closed um we're still doing all of the protocols. In fact, I would, if there was another person in this room, I would have my mask on. Um, but I can say that I hope we are able to reactivate our acquisition um, goals, which will be to continue to collect from master artists uh, who get heritage awards, who are involved in the traditional arts apprenticeship program. We're really interested also, I think, in pieces that like that one of the mini blind that that uh, Kelly made, ones that speak to contemporary issues. Um, we don't have too much like that in, from that's in the Anishinaabe collections. We do have some pieces that deal with water pollution uh, that were made by uh, uh, Wasco Indians. Um, and yeah, we have some we do have some quilts that talk, uh, Anishinaabe quilts that talk about land rights and, and so I, I think if, in, and I'd love to see, you know, maybe there's, well, I know there's, I know Jenna Wood is making masks, COVID masks. And so we would love to have that kind of thing in the collection too. So things that speak to contemporary issues. Terrific, thank you. Well, Miigwech, Chi Miigwech, right, to, to you and for Renee popping in last minute. Thank you so much for being willing to join us. That was really generous of you. Um, it's really uh, been a pleasure to be able to highlight some of the wonderful pieces from your collection, Marsha. So thank you so much for, for your generosity. Um, it's been great for our community. It's been a wonderful process for me personally to just get to discover some of this work and some of these stories. And, uh, you know, it's, it's step one. So I'm excited to see what else we're able to do. Thank you. And, you know, it's what for us, it's just great pleasure. I mean, now in the time of Zoom, we can actually use this as a tool to make our collections more known and we 
do encourage people to make appointments um, because we are short staffed, but make appointments ahead of time. And, you know, we're more than happy uh, for artists to come and take a look for scholars. Uh, that's why this collection is here. We, we mean for it to be used for research and teaching. Terrific, thank you. All right, we're like gonna to call say, it a day. Oh yeah, go ahead. I would just like to say that as an LTBB artist, I really am enjoying the relationship between MSU and our tribe now. It has evolved into a positive thing. Kimmy Gwetch, beautiful. Good to see you. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks, Marsha.